knowing who you are, knowing what you stand for, knowing what you're all about, knowing what you're going to bring to the table. These are such important skills just to be a successful person. They're just as important. When you're fighting a disease like cancer and you have so many decisions that you have to make and you have to be productive and proactive. You don't want to be defined by cancer. You want to always be yourself. 10 months ago, I was diagnosed with a rare, aggressive, acute, bordering on the brain, nose cancer. Who gets nose cancer? Oh, it brought me to my knees, and I had to stand up and look cancer in the eyes, and I had to say, you have met your match, and I had to believe in it. Well, the first decision I had to make was, how was I going to accept this? Was I going to say, woe is me? Why did this happen to me? Do I deserve this? What did I do wrong? No, I said, this is a bump in the road, a really big bump in the road, and I better show gratitude and think of what I have. Oh, I had so much. I was going on 80 years old. I'd never had an operation. I was taking no medication. I went to the doctors all of the time. I got a second opinion right away. Oh, I had the most amazing support system, a wonderful, wonderful family. I've been married to the same man for 58 years. I had been teaching full time for 62 years. I loved my classes. I had no plans to retire. I loved what I was doing. I had traveled over 90 different countries, mostly third world countries, doing humanitarian travel. And oh my goodness, this brought me so much joy. It was going to be all about gratitude. My next decision is, who do you tell? When do you tell them? I found that so many people keep it close to the heart. They don't tell anyone. It's just their friends that are really close in their family. And when I said to them, why don't you tell anyone? And they say, it's not as real if you don't talk about it. And they said, I don't want people to feel pity for me. And I said, I can't buy into those two things. So what did I do? I went to Linda the barber, and she shaved off my head, and I put it on Facebook. No one could talk behind my back. No one could second guess what was happening to me. And then because I had this rare cancer people didn't know about, I decided to start my blog which was battling cancer, wear your strongest and your best armor. Also at this time, people were shocked because I belonged to the Green Light stand-up comedy group in Ridgefield. And from the stage of the Playhouse in front of 500 people, they gave me a shout out to cure cancer for me. And people said, weren't you embarrassed? I said, no, I applauded these people. I didn't need to keep quiet about it. Well, my next big decision that I had to make was, how was I going to learn about cancer? People don't talk about it. I read everything that I could. And so many people I had known for so many years, I didn't know they had cancer. All of a sudden, I was part of the inner circle. So they started talking to me, and I learned so much from them. And then I started my big red notebook. In this notebook was every comment, concern, and question that I could possibly think about. And my radiologist called me the great inquisitor. And we would start off each session, and he would say to me, Darla, how many questions do you have for me today? And I would tell him. And during my last radiation session, 
She said to me, Darla, you ask more questions than any other patient I've ever had. They were deep, they were thoughtful, they were real. I am so glad you asked these questions. You learned so much more about cancer than most people, and it helped you deal with the disease. I wish more people would ask these questions. So ask questions. Also, I found the American Cancer Society and the hospitals offer so many free help sessions for people. Oh, I was so happy. I was not too prideful. I took advantage of every free thing that came down the pike. I got free financial help, nutrition help, mind, body, spirit, appearance. I was so thankful for the help that I got along the way. And then, oh, I had to deal with the procedures and the tests and how I was going to handle these. They were endless. They were painful. They were embarrassing. They were just endless. There was the PET scans and the CAT scans and the MRIs and the endoscopies and the radiation and the bone taps. Oh, my gosh. And I could have said, no, 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 I don't want these. You can do that. But to me, it was, do I want to live or am I going to die? And I was all for living. The most difficult part for me was my mask of fear. And you've probably seen it in the picture up there. I still, when I take this out, I begin to shake and sweat and tears come to my eyes for six weeks every single day except on weekends. This was buckled to my face. It was so frightening, so scary, so tight with the eyes open watching the big machines coming around me. I had to wear this because they have to pinpoint so specifically where the cancer is and you cannot move one fraction of an inch. And this mask was my mask of fear, but this mask is now my mask of courage. Because whenever something comes up and I say, can I do this? I think about the six weeks with this mask and believe me, it makes a difference. Well, after this, what did I have to deal with going to the hospital? Long, long, long hospital stay. The first thing I did, people couldn't believe, I didn't take a full medical leave for Westcott. I kept my online courses, and I'm so glad I did. Two online courses, focus, keep them going. It made me feel productive. Also, I said, only family. I don't want any visitors at the high school. Hospital. Oh my goodness, people went along. They respected my wishes. I was so glad. And people said, You didn't want visitors? I said, No. I said, I think of my own experiences. I've stood out in the hall, like in a reception line, waiting to get in to see a patient. When I finally got in to see the patient, what did I say? What was politically correct? What do I bring? The person was so tired and so ill, and they're trying to entertain and keep everyone happy. I don't want to do this. You have to be yourself. You have to own it. People were wonderful. They supported me through social media and afterwards. I also went to the hospital, and I took hats and jewelry and colorful scarves to wear with my Johnny coat. And it made me feel better. Also in the hospital, if I had any, any energy at all, I would get up and I would walk around with my toxic trolley cart. I said to the nurses, tell me, are there any patients that would like me to visit? We can talk cancer, we can not talk cancer. 
and I would go in. I was like the Walmart greeter of the oncology wards. I met so many wonderful people and talked to them. Also, I found in the hospital, it was like the UN. Everybody was from a different country. So I started my bulletin board. And on my bulletin board, I had all of the maps of the countries and pinpointed where they were for. Oh, the cross-fertilization of cultural ideas was wonderful. Also, I had people who came in who knew me from so many places, from Toastmasters Public Speaking Club, from Westcon, from the Women's Center, from TBICO, the Career Center, from educational literacy programs. And they said to me, you know, Dr. Shaw, when I'm off my shift and if you're feeling okay, can you help me write a resume? Help me study for this test. Talk about Westcon. Give me some ideas for speeches. And I said, yes. I was so happy to be alive and productive. Oh, this worked so well for me. And I'm not saying any of you would do any of this. You certainly wouldn't. This isn't your toolkit. This is my toolkit. This is what you have to figure out to get you through this. Well, I also had a woman come to me and she said, Darl, I know you go into the schools and you do storytelling. I want to tell you my story. I want to hear your story. Can I come in during the night shift? It's easier. And we can share our stories. I said, oh my gosh, I'd love that. And that's what happened. And we started storytelling. Sometimes it was a minute the buzzer would go off. Sometimes it took three or four nights to finish a story. But our storytelling group ended up with seven people telling stories most of them had never heard before. And then lastly, I had so much material for stand-up comedy. I could not believe it. I did my first stand-up gig three weeks ago in Brewster, New York. I was so pleased with the results, particularly for the cancer people and their families, and they were my target audience. And finally, I'd just like to say, does cancer change you? Oh my goodness, does cancer change you. Remember I said I wasn't going to retire? July 1st, I'm going. But on my own terms, I am still teaching two classes each semester. I'm doing community outreach, and I'm doing alumni relations. I'm doing the things that I want to do along with other things. Also, I have found that there are four things that I'm really going to focus on. I'm going to focus on family and friends, still having adventures, and building memories, because that's all you're left with are the memories. I can't go to third world countries. My immune system has been compromised. So my husband and I are going on what we call our national Christmas card tour. And we are renting a small RV. We divided the country into six parts. We're starting in June to visit all the people we send Christmas cards to that we haven't seen in years. And it's all about reconnecting. And then it's certainly important that we also downsize. I never had material things that cost money. I could care less about that. But I'm a teacher, so I have stuff. So anyway, I got rid of 28 boxes of costumes. It went to a homeschool program. I had 10,000 children's books, 35 different organizations. Even the reading clinic here at Central is going to be taking some of my books. My puppets and my instruments have gone to preschools. Also, I downsized. I lost 30 pounds. You do not want to go on the cancer diet. It is not worth it. But since I lost the 30 pounds, I am working very, very, very hard to keep this weight off, to exercise and eat properly. And lastly, I'd just like to say, 
I am going to continue advocacy. I have always been an advocate for gender issues because I teach women's history. Also for educational reform, and Jesse is my hero. And I also am an advocate for my program for Alzheimer's work, letting kids in the schools know about it. And now I am dealing with helping people with cancer. I'm being trained in mind-body leadership. I am also working with the Cancer Couch, which is comedy and therapy. I am running fashion shows for people with cancer, and I'm a support group leader for head and fa facial cancer. As a teacher, I will also go into biology classes and talk and start fundraising. But most of all, most of all, I would like to be a role model for other cancer patients. I do not want them to let the cancer define them. I want them to be their own person. When I left the hospital for the last time, I had two people say to me, you know, Darla, you may never, ever be 100% again. And I looked at them and I said, that's OK, because I'm going to be 110%. I said, I'm going to take as much of the Darla as was there for the 100%, bring that person back, and then what I'm going to do, I'm going to add 10% for all I learned about the disease, the resiliency, the courage and bravery that it put. And with this 110%, I am going to kick the crap out of cancer, not just for me, but for other people who are going through what I've been through. And in conclusion, I would just like to say that I'm dedicating my talk today to Tom Vogt, who was my role model that I look to for how to deal with cancer, and also my ex-student who's here somewhere today, Ellen Shea in the back there. Love, Ellen. She is another amazing cancer survivor who could be a role model for anyone else. Thank you.